What is the difference between linear and non-linear music? How to compose linear versus non-linear music? And what is the new game audio program at Berkeley College of Music? If you're interested in these questions, then this episode was made just for you. My name is Amit Weiner and welcome to Rewind. I'm a composer for film and TV and I'm your host and I'm on a mission to help musicians find career opportunities and help them navigate the vast world of the music industry. With 20 years of industry experience and having advised to hundreds of musicians on career issues in the last decade, I've created this podcast to help you turn your passion into reality. In this episode, our guest is composer Noah Beasley, assistant professor of game audio at Berkeley College of Music, and let's hear it directly from her. The difference between uh, film and games uh, is uh, not intuitive to understand, and uh, it's very it's really crucial. So, like I said, I, I think the biggest difference is that that concept of linearity, right? Um, when you watch a film uh, over and over again, uh, every time the same thing is going to happen, right? It's like deterministic. Uh, it feels like there's a choice, but uh, there isn't. The choice was already made, and it's always going to be that choice. Um, in games, you need to adapt to player choice. Um, and that's a really hard thing to do musically. And it just requires a whole different mentality uh, in terms of how you approach composing it. And what is that mentality, you probably ask yourself? Then that's what this episode is all about. Welcome to Rewind, an optimistic podcast that'll help you in your successful career in music. Amit Weiner hosts musicians, composers, professors, and sound wizards as they share their life stories and career decisions. Stay tuned, it's gonna be epic. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Rewind the Musicians podcast, a podcast that will help you build and elevate your career in music. In this episode, our special guest is composer Noah Beasley from Boston. Noah is assistant professor of game audio at Berklee College of Music. Noah is a composer and multi-instrumentalist working primarily in the indie game space. Her work includes games such as A Token War and Protodroid Delta. She's currently working on Phosphy for Uproom Games, as well as a new game for Blue Owl Studios. Noah is a professor of video game scoring at Berkeley College of Music and a co-organizer at Game Audio Boston. A graduate of Berkeley, majored in film scoring and composition and minored in video game scoring as a Berkeley Merit and BMI Foundation Scholar, and awards include BMI Film Scoring Scholarship, Geronimus Kachikas Award for Outstanding Composition, Video Game Audio and Dode Scholarships for Women, and more. Noah Beasley from Boston, thank you so much for joining this episode. Thank you for having me. Noah, could you describe for the listeners your musical journey and how you have arrived to where you are today? Sure, yeah. I mean, I guess my journey with music starts from a pretty young age. Uh, both my parents are classical musicians. Uh, so my father is a clarinetist and uh, mother is a violist. So I know all the viola jokes. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I, from when I was a, a kid, um, they kind of uh, decided like, okay, well, you're going to play violin, um, which I did not enjoy. Uh, so uh, at some point I just said, okay, I want to decide the instrument that uh, I'm going to play. Uh, and so I picked up uh, the drum uh, at around age uh, like 11 or 12. Uh, so I became uh, mostly a jazz drummer. Uh, I played uh, drums, you know, through high school um, and then eventually picked up uh, guitar and piano as well. Um, uh, after high school, I went to a school called Rimon, uh, which is a really, really fantastic college. I really think of it as where I got kind of all of my, all of those, those music skills that I, that I needed later on. Uh, I also went there because they had a great transfer program, uh, with Berkeley College of Music. Uh, going there allowed me to finish a lot of my degree, uh, and transfer a bunch of those credits, um, to Berkeley. 
Uh, and also, uh, you know, it, it gave me the opportunity to uh, go to the audition as prepared as possible so that I could get a scholarship, which actually allowed me to come to Berkeley. Um, at Limon, I actually went as a uh, as a vocalist. I studied jazz vocal, jazz vocals and improvisation um, for a couple of years. I really loved it, but at some point I also started uh, studying arranging, and I think that was really the gateway for me uh, more into composition. Um, so, uh, you know, arranging, uh, arranging really is kind of composition, you know, uh, you're arranging, but you're also writing your own lines, you're writing the counterpoint, uh, you're, you're orchestrating, uh, all this stuff really starts getting that composition part of your brain going. Uh, and I said, Hey, I really like this. Uh, you know, this is, this is great. I think this is what I want to do. Uh, so I studied really intensely for a year, um, with um with the composer Jeroen Gottfried, uh, who had just started a new program at Limon. And it was really, really fantastic. I mean, most of what I know about uh composition and orchestration, I think I can trace back to that uh year of very, very, very intense work uh that was uh just wonderful. So yeah, I came to Berkeley. Um I studied film scoring, uh video game scoring was just a you know a minor back then. So um I, you know, I took as much video game scoring as I can, which was minoring in it. Uh, so I studied film scoring and composition, decided I really wanted to go down the media scoring route rather than concert composition. Um, and then I graduated in 2019, which was, uh, as we all know, a really a great year to graduate. <laughs> uh, I worked for a year in admissions for Berkeley. Uh, you know, I was an admissions interviewer. Uh, I oversaw um, all kinds of applications and, and and everything. Really learned kind of the ins and outs of how Berkeley works as an institution. Um, and I was going to move to LA in May of 2020, uh, which uh, you know, for some some reason, that didn't happen. Um, and so I really pivoted more. Uh, you know, I've always loved indie games. I wanted to work in indie games, but that for me was really. Um, was really a driving force in staying in Boston and uh, just pretty much going indie, right? Which is uh, something that is a lot easier to do when you work remote. Um, so yeah, since then I've, I've been working on the indie scene. Uh, last year, I was asked to become a professor at Berkeley um, in their new video game scoring major, which is, was kind of a big full circle moment for me. Uh, it was really, really exciting. Uh, and it's been, been really wonderful. That's super interesting. And I think we can divide the talk into a couple of parts. Maybe the first part will be about Berkeley and then about you as a composer. So let's start with Berkeley. First of all, what is the new program for game audio and video game scoring in Berkeley? Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you asked. Uh, I mean, it's a really, really exciting program, um, especially considering I, I don't think that Berkeley's had a new major in uh, several decades. Uh, so uh, this really, really came uh, from, you know, a push from the department uh, to to make this a major just because they saw how much demand there was for video game scoring. So film scoring has long been a, a major at Berkeley um, and video game scoring um, has been a minor for for a while, I think around a decade or so. Um, <clears throat> so now we're seeing this rapid expansion happening uh, because guess what? Uh, when you offer video game scoring as a major, people take it as a major because uh, it's such an exciting thing that so many people are interested in. So um, I think even with the anticipation of how popular it would be, um, it, it was even more popular than that, right? Um, so uh, yeah, just a really exciting time. The major is growing rapidly. Uh, it's really our job right now uh, to develop curriculum. So we're taking something that was designed to be a small part of your degree, right? Uh, a minor and turn it into an entire track with all the skills that everyone um, needs, right? Like middleware and, uh, you know, obviously the composition skills as well, how to work with players, all of that stuff. So um, yeah, just just a, a, a really, really exciting time uh, for, for the department. It's been around for about a year now as a major. We've had another video game composer in episode two of the podcast, which I recommend to all the listeners go back and listen to, Mason Lieberman from Tencent, and also a very uh, successful video game composer himself. So maybe can you describe uh, for a second the things that you've just mentioned? What are middlewares? What do we need them for? And what is there to study about middlewares? Middleware uh, is, you know, it's it's a... 
It's a very important subject in uh, game scoring, which doesn't really exist at all when you look at uh, uh, concert composition or media composition or any kind of linear composition. Um, what happens when you go nonlinear is that um, suddenly the music is interacting with player choice, right? So it doesn't have a beginning and a middle and an end and, you know, builds up and, and has just that, that, um, that form. Uh, it, it's just constantly, you have to start, start thinking of it in a, in a different way, which is really, really hard because we are linear creatures who live in linear time, right? Um, but you have to start thinking, oh, the, the beginning of my track, that's also the middle of my track and it's also the end of my track, right? And, and so, uh, these things that we all naturally do, especially those of us who have, who have studied composition extensively, right? We kind of start things out and build it up and then have, you know, a peak and then, then it ends. And uh, it, you, you have to like throw all of that out of the window. Um, all of this to say, um, that it's just demands a totally different approach when you're working with, uh, with game music, right? Um, so what middleware does is, uh, it takes all of this music that you wrote, all this, this music that's designed to be nonlinear. And, um, it, it, you set a set, a set of rules for, uh, what happens to the audio based on what the player does, right? So it kind of sits somewhere between your DAW where you are purely making music and the game where it's purely just, um, here are the player's actions. Um, so it lets you, uh, the composer, kind of um, decide uh, what the most elegant way for the audio to operate is, right? So there are some games that are uh, that go directly into the engine, right? And you might have someone whose job it is to do audio implementation, or sometimes you might give it to a developer who doesn't really know anything about audio. Um, that necessarily, uh, especially in the second, uh, in the second of those cases. A lot of times your audio doesn't really get represented the way that you want it to. Uh, what middleware allows you to do is um, it, it it just allows you to think of it like a musician, right? Uh, think, okay, well, if the player goes from this location to this location, I can tell the program, here's where the phrases end. So you can wait until the end of this phrase to go into another phrase. You know, try to do that in a script. You know, it's a lot harder. Uh, so it's this really, really elegant software that uh, just allows us to have this middle area between the game uh, and and the music. And if we try to describe it more technically, so you take the mastered audio from the DAW that you work on, right? And mm -hmm. you do the music in the DAW, right? You don't uh, produce and compose the music in the middleware. And you take the mm -hmm. mastered audio and then you put it in the middleware. And then how does it go from the middleware to the game engine like Unity or something like that? So what is the technical process over there? And another question, is it always a musician that is best using the middleware or is it also sometimes used by the game developer? Yeah, so you're always going to want someone uh, who uh, knows something about music and audio to work in the middleware, or you may as well just have someone uh, do it as a as a script, right? It's uh, middleware is it, it has tools that are intended for musicians, so you should at least know a little bit about you know how to make nice fade curves and a little bit about like like transients and like kind of stuff that you need to make those elegant transitions. So almost always the person who's working in the middle air has some kind of musical education. Um, technically what's happening is, uh, you know, when you, when you make your, um, when you're working on your middleware file and you have all of these audio, um, events that happen, um, in a middleware like Wise, for instance, um, <laughs> well, Wise gets a little bit more complicated, but, um, you basically have all this stuff under the hood that's saying, here's what's happening in the game, here's what's happening in the audio. And those are all connected to events, uh, which basically uh, just trigger different actions in the audio. Um, then you build your events into a uh, sound bank, uh, which is loaded into the game. And it's basically telling the, it's, it's telling the system, here are the different audio files that you need to load. And here's when you're going to load them into RAM. And here's when you're going to stream them from the CPU. Uh, et cetera. So basically it just, it gets this big, big set of instructions uh, from the middleware and all of that kind of uh, resource management and stuff. Uh, ideally that kind of happens inside of the middleware. So you decide, um, you know, here, here's where I'm going to put my different sound banks and where they're going to be loaded into the game and how, how that's going to happen. Uh, so 
It's very kind of oversimplified uh, explanation of, of a little bit of the technical side of it, but hopefully that um, that that paints a clear picture. Yeah, sure. Because it's an audio program, we cannot really do a tutorial here as a, in the podcast, but I think it's, it's really helpful and gives a lot of uh, insights to what it is. How would you define the differences between film scoring and scoring for video games? So what other courses do you have in the Berkeley program for video games scoring? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's an excellent question. And uh, in my intro course that I teach, um, that's the very, very first thing that I, fo- I mean, it's something that I focus on throughout. So I teach the kind of um, core courses, the core writing courses. So all the way through intro, you know, through intermediate and advanced and eventually their directed study. Um, so I, I'm always bringing this up because it's something that you constantly have to relearn. But that difference between uh, film and games uh, is uh, not intuitive to understand. And uh, it's very, it's really crucial. So like I said, I, I think the biggest difference is that that concept of linearity, right? Um, when you watch a film uh, over and over again, uh, every time the same thing is going to happen, right? It's like deterministic. Uh, it feels like there's a choice. But uh, there isn't. The choice was already made, and it's always going to be that choice. Um, in games, you need to adapt to player choice. Um, and that's a really hard thing to do musically. And it just requires a whole different mentality uh, in terms of how you approach composing it, right? Um, typically, you're working with a lot of different loops. Um, and there's a lot of different techniques that you can use, right? The simplest, I would say, is just you have a a long two or three minute loop that just loops it over and over again for each location. But you can have loops that are very short, like a like a a loop for each phrase or, um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can break it up. You can have different layers that come in and out based on what the player is doing. But uh, yeah, with games, you're kind of thinking about different loops where each one of them has kind of a distinct feeling, right? Or it has layers that build up and down, for instance. But it's not dynamic, right? It's not like uh, it's not like a film where uh, the characters are really sad and now they're excited and now they're fighting and now they're this and they're that and the music's just jumping up and down and hitting sync points and all kinds of stuff. Um, with game music, it's just a lot more. There's a lot more work that goes into making it consistent, right? Um, if you're in the explore mode, uh, you kind of need to consistently be feeling like that uh, in something that's going to be looping over and over. And then battle has to maintain that consistent feeling. uh, And it's all about how you switch between those two, right? Um, So uh, it's easier said than done. It sounds kind of easy, like, oh, okay, well, you just kind of do the same thing for a while. But your composer instincts are telling you not to do that. And, uh, you know, fighting against that is something that um, I I feel like a lot of game game composers uh, struggle with. I know that I always have to stop myself from making all those big uh, kind of moves that I want to be making. That's super interesting as a composer as well. I want to ask you a question I've been asked a lot by uh, young people, young students and people that are interested in learning music. So we are both uh, teachers at academic institutions. I'm from the Jerusalem Academy of Music and Dance. You're from Berkeley College of Music. And what would you say to people that are asking your advice, whether they should go to study in an institution doing a degree in music or just learn everything by themselves by YouTube, you know, Google it and learn everything from manuals online? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think that's a, that's a great question. And uh, especially, uh, you know, especially in the U.S. where education is very expensive, it's definitely hard to say, oh, you know, just just go to school, just go do a degree and uh, and you'll you'll learn everything you need there. Uh, so yeah, the the other side of that is, uh, you know, if you do decide to go get a degree, uh, there's some great programs out there specifically for game audio. Actually, I think that Berkeley is kind of pioneering, uh, that right now. Um, it's, uh, maybe one of the only programs that I, that I know of that has, uh, that has a, a game audio major. And what, really, when you go out there into the industry and you meet people, uh, you find that uh, there's an overwhelming number of them are Berkeley grads, right? Uh, so that that tells you that not only does it give you a lot of the skills that you need uh, to be competitive in this industry, it also kind of comes with a great network of of people who you immediately have a have a connection with, uh, which is problematic from an equity standpoint, right? Oh, yeah, just go get an expensive degree and then you'll have a, a network of people who you can uh, talk to and identify with. Um, but unfortunately, it's a problem that's bigger than 
game audio or, or even the music industry. That also applies to episode two with Mason Lieberman, who is also a graduate of Berkeley. So it's interesting to, uh, to see the connections. And just to share what I usually tell people that are asking me that is that the environment of an institution, being around musicians, whether it's the faculty, the students, being inside an institution that five days a week or four days a week, doesn't matter, is uh, doing music all the time and you're surrounded by music all the time. This is something that cannot be done through YouTube because you're sitting alone in your home and just seeing YouTube. And also the interactive part of learning, which doesn't exist on YouTube, because if I want to show um, the professor my music and have his feedback on it, that's also something that YouTube doesn't have yet. So it's only uh, like a one-way road learning from YouTube, uh, whereas relearning, to me at least, is always like a two-way road, you know, a dialogue between a teacher and a student. So these are also the benefits of learning in an institution to me. Yeah, absolutely. I, actually, I think one one place that does a really good job of that um, kind of hybridizing that, actually, there's two places, which is uh, Berkeley Online and ThinkSpace Education, uh, which, uh, you know, full disclosure, I worked at ThinkSpace for a while before I was at Berkeley, but um, those are some programs where they have pre-recorded lectures uh, from vetted industry professionals, uh, and also you have a chance to get some some feedback from uh, from the faculty that that works there. Um, and you know it's a much cheaper option than than going to to uh, you know brick and mortar university. Um, that being said, I, I personally think there's there's nothing like being in person with with your students, having them really feel seen. Um, you know, actually develop that connection with them week week after week. Uh, I don't think that that is ever going to be re replaced um, by anything you can do online. We've all had those difficulties during COVID when we moved to remote learning only, which was not the best scenario for teaching, I think. So now let's talk about you as a composer. What are the projects that you are working on these days? And how do you start writing a music uh, for a new video game? Maybe you can share your process when you start music for a new game. Most recently, I worked on a game called Protodroid Delta. It was uh, published by Humble Games, uh, which that was that was a really, really exciting moment. Um, right now, I'm working on a game called Phosphy uh, from Uproom Games. It's a Metroidvania-style game, uh, really different from uh, a lot of the, you know, the stuff I've worked on so far. It has more of kind of a folk mandolin and voice-based uh, soundtrack. So I get to play a little bit, sing a little bit. Uh, that's been really fun. Um, and I'm working also on a new game from uh, Blue Owl Studios uh, that uh, it hasn't, hasn't officially been announced yet, but if you check out their... Um, social media. It's looking so gorgeous. I love to work with talented artists uh, because it's just so inspirational for me as a musician. Um, and, you know, both are, both are great teams that I've really, really enjoyed working with. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I'm up to now, as well as, as some, a, a few smaller, uh, a few smaller contracts that I'm doing. That's just kind of the life of, uh, of, of a, of a freelance composer. Uh, you're just kind of, always working on slow burner stuff uh, that are just kind of uh, dotted around. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, how do I, uh, how do I start working on like a new track or a new project? Um, uh, one thing that really changed the way I uh, think about that question uh, is something that I learned with um, a professor I had at Berkeley called Sheldon Mirowitz, who he's now my coworker, which is really fun. Uh, I actually, uh, you know, I took this method and now I teach it to, to my students as well, um, who aren't going to study with him in the film scoring department. So I get to be the, the game scoring departments, uh, you know, impart Sheldon's wisdom into the, the game scoring department. But, uh, what he advises to do and what I do now when I start working on a new project is I, uh, make a list of adjectives. Um, and I try to be as specific as possible and there'll be like seven to 10 adjectives. Um, and then, uh, really, really think about what the implications are on the music from those adjectives. Um, so, uh, these aren't broad adjectives like sci-fi or fantasy. It's, it's like really, really, really specific things, um, like, uh, you know, sorrow and, uh, you know, bleak, or I don't know why I'm only thinking of negative things, but, uh, you know, uh, colorful, shiny, uh, playful, 
Um, all these things that are really, really going to uh, help me take my view of the game from this kind of bird's eye view into this, this microscopic view that you're just constantly tweaking and tweaking to discover what's kind of the essence of, of that game. Um, I think once you do that, um, you can really make music that is custom to that world, right? It's not just sci-fi music. It's not just fantasy music. It's not just music for a kid's game. It's for a game that's colorful and sorrowful and, uh, and bright and, and also a coming of age story. Um, so that's been very helpful to me to not put pressure on myself to think about the music right away. I first, because, you know, when you do that, you go down this rabbit hole of what's the music that I like, not what's the music that's right for this project. So um, I, I, as much as I can kind of divorce myself from the music, get to the essence of the game and then say, OK, well, what's a musical manifestation of all of these different adjectives? Um, so, A, it leads to music that's much more accurate to the, the world of the project that you're working on. And B, it's it's fantastic for writer's block because you've already made a bunch of those decisions for yourself uh, before you even start. I have to share something with you about that. I'm working a lot as a library music composer, doing music for trailers and for libraries like Universal, BMG, Warner. And in the library music business, it's actually the opposite uh, process. So I'm writing like, for example, an album, which I've just finished. And then when I'm filling the metadata, sometimes it's the composer, some, sometimes it's the publisher, but usually the composer helps with that as well. So the metadata uh, is like uh, an Excel sheet of hundreds of those words. Like I'm having one in front of me right now. So like you have moods, positive moods. So you have achievement, allure, amazement, angelic, aspiration, artsy, assured. That's only in A. Okay, so you have hundreds of those words and you should describe the music that you've already written according to those tags, actually, for the search engines in those in the engine of the library and the company for people to find it later later on. So I think it's fascinating that you actually start your composing with those words that describe the music yeah i mean i think it makes sense uh it makes a lot of sense for library music which is kind of the the opposite of making custom music right you you uh the music's already made and it's about finding the right project for it rather than, than the other way around so it definitely makes sense that it's a similar process just kind of coming at it from reverse yeah and Coming also as a film music composer, so what do you actually get from the developer? I mean, do you get a movie of the game? Do you get like images from the game or only the story in words? What do you have in front of you when you start composing the game? Yeah, that actually touches on something that is another really, really big difference between film and game music and industries that uh, is one of my favorite things about games, actually, that I forgot to mention before, which is. Um, with a film, you know, you, uh, you come in at the very end, right? <laughs> you, you're, you come in when it's done and, and you have to come in when it's done because it needs to be picture locked or, uh, your thing is gonna like not line up in a millisecond and it like ruins your entire queue, right? Uh, so they've been working on it for years and years and years. It's been written and pre-production and production and, you know, all the post-production and editing. And then you come in and you're the composer and they're like, okay, we have a release date. We have everything locked. Like we're just doing some VFX and stuff. Um, all right. Now write all the music in like six weeks or two months or, and, and you have very, very little time to kind of take this thing that's already done and uh, impose your music on it. Uh, you know, and it's, uh, that's not, I don't say that, uh, you know, as a derogatory thing for, for film. I think that it's a wonderful craft to be able to understand what, what this locked picture is telling you and to um, express that the best way you can in music. Uh, it's a really beautiful art form, but uh, it's very, very different from games where you're kind of a team member from the start. Uh, and I think that's that probably is my favorite thing about games uh, is that um, you're building the world of the game together with the developer uh, because it doesn't have to be locked uh, because the music is kind of fluid and um, interactive. You can start working on the music the second there's a name or an idea or someone has a premise for the game, right? You can make that list of adjectives. Uh, you can start working on your music already. 
So um, this is kind of a, a roundabout way to say uh, I can really come in at any point in the process uh, with a developer, right? Uh, they usually will have something called a game design doc, uh, which is uh, it can be from a page to this whole like giant Bible of everything, every last little detail about the game. But they'll have some version of that where they'll talk about the setting and, and the characters and the world of the game. Um, and so that's what I'll get, right? Um, uh, I uh, Hopefully it answers questions to me about the settings and the mechanics. It's really, really important uh, when you think about what uh, interactive method you want to choose for writing the music. Um, and uh, yeah, just, just as much info as I can get uh, together with pictures. Pictures are really, really helpful if, if there's some concept art for the game. Uh, so the answer is because you come in uh, at a much, much earlier stage than this is done, you make music for it, um, then it can, there's wild variation in what you get from the developer, depending on what stage in the process they bring you. Yeah, I'd love to ask you also about the feedbacks that the developers are giving to you, the difference between feedbacks from uh, film directors and developers. But before, the thing that you mentioned about film music that you as the composer comes at the last stage, it's very interesting because I'm uh, a lot of time people ask me why in trailer music, the music is never the music from the film. I mean, in 90-90% of trailers these days, the music for the trailer is not the music of the film. And uh, there are a couple of answers to that, but the first and the most important one is that when the trailer is published, they didn't even approach a composer yet. So not only the music has not been written, but there is not a composer even at the stage when the trailer is uh, is out. And what, what would you say is the difference and what kind of feedbacks do you receive from developers? Is it like direct feedbacks about uh, can you do it longer or can you change the violin to a cello or is it more like more of the emotional feedbacks about the the music yeah i, I mean it varies wildly from developer to, to developer right uh and uh you actually touch on something really interesting which is do they give you musical feedback or emotional feedback and uh usually what i'm doing is no matter what kind of feedback uh, they give me I steer them more towards um, giving me that emotional feedback or giving me feedback in normal, like plain words. Um, I think that a lot of the time uh, developers can be a little bit intimidated about giving feedback on music because they think, oh, I don't play an instrument. I don't have a musical background. This person's trained in music and like they'll think I'm saying something really stupid. And I, I, uh, I think that's kind of, uh, so, I mean, I love teaching, uh, you know, and I, I see myself very much as a teacher. And I, I think that that extends to my relationships with developers too. Um, when I'm working with a new developer, I think part of what I do is teach them that it's okay. First of all, I'm not going to judge them for not having any music knowledge. And in fact, I would prefer that they not have any music knowledge. And I would prefer, for, I mean, it's okay if they have some music knowledge, but I don't want them to talk to me. Uh, in musical terms, that's not their job, right? Their job is to make the game. And my job is to take their feedback and translate that into what that means for the music, right? So um, I think a lot of times they'll, you know, sometimes they they are, they, they do play instrument, they do know about music, they can give you some really, really great musical feedback that I, that can be very helpful. But um, most of the time, I, I, I just say like, okay, what are you feeling? And how do you want it to feel different? And I would prefer to kind of identify myself, what I think is, is doing that and, and why they feel that way and how I can change that. Um, in terms of the amount of feedback, uh, that changes so much also between developer and developer. I, I've had some developers, like every single thing I write, it's like, yeah, cool, this is great. Yeah, this is great. Okay, I'll just put this in the game. And other developers that are like, oh, you know, at, at like six seconds, uh, what if we could like change this note a little? And it's like the, like really kind of gets really into the nitty gritty details. Um, I really, I my ideal developer sits somewhere in the middle where uh, they don't just kind of okay everything because then sometimes I can lose track of exactly what they're looking for. Um, but also not super micromanagey. I really love developers who will just kind of Again, tell me what they're feeling. Tell me about different sections and and what they think, um, how they how they might want it to change, and I can take that and and kind of refine it and make something that they'll feel really good putting in their game. Yeah, which is actually very similar to working with a film director. I mean, it's always better 
instead of him saying to you, can you take the violin uh, an octave lower just because he thinks maybe it's, it will be better just to tell <laughs> right. you what he wants to hear in the music? Could it be more nostalgic or more sad or less energetic or something like that? And you'll decide whether to take the violin or just to put a viola or to change the chord. I mean, we, are, we have the musician skills to do that. And I want to ask you for... All the listeners that are interested in being video games composers. So how big is the team in an indie game, both of the developers and the music team? Are you the only composer in indie games? And what's the difference between AAA games regarding the team and indie games? Yeah, I mean, there's a massive difference between AAA and indie in that regard. Uh, AAA games will have you know hundreds and hundreds of people working on it. It's just massive, massive teams. Uh, handling enormous budgets and very like long timelines and um, it's a whole different production than uh, indie games. Uh, with indie, it also varies a lot. Uh, a lot of it depends on funding. Uh, but part of the issue is that indie really encompasses a lot of types of games, right? It encompasses everything from a solo developer who's putting their game up on Steam uh, and you know, it can be a team of, 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 you know, dozens and dozens of people, uh, with, uh, with a very, very healthy budget, uh, from a publisher. Uh, so the issue is that all of these things are considered indie. Uh, so it's a little bit hard to answer that question. Um, the games that I work on are usually just smaller teams ranging from, uh, solo dev to uh, a team of about, uh, probably around 10 people. Um, so, uh, yeah, often I'll be the only audio person. I actually, I'm, I, I, I've made sound effects before. And, and a lot of times when you are working in an indie game, you make the sound effects, you kind of handle the implementation and you do the music and all of the audio stuff. Um, I'm really happy that I'm in a point in my career where I can say, Hey, sound effects are not really my forte. Uh, I'm going to, can we bring in a sound designer? If you're going to have the same budget. Actually, you're probably going to end up paying them less because it's going to take them less time to make a better product. Uh, my skills really lie in music. Uh, and so I'm going to make the best music possible. Um, but we're going to bring in someone who has also dedicated a lot of time to their craft and they're, they're great at sound effects. Um, usually developers are really receptive to this, especially when I say, Hey, it's not actually going to add to the budget of the game. If anything, it'll, it'll lower it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, th these days I'm mostly working with um people who are are sound designers um because i after after a couple of years of, of doing sound design i've just come to the conclusion that uh you know it's not it's not what i would prefer to be doing i think that's a great tip in any field in music and also in general i mean know your strength and outsource your weaknesses so know the things that you are good at and you know uh, the value of your time and outsource all the things that you are less good at and people can do it in less time than you and even with better results so i think it brings us also to one of the last questions of this episode what would be your tips for people starting out in the world of music today we've touched a, a little bit on it uh before but maybe you can summarize a couple of tips that you can give to people whether it's composers or musicians in general i i mean this is relevant to all all uh all musicians but um it's the advice that i often give to game composers which is um it takes a lot of time and you're not going to be able to have um a, a stable income when you start out it's just impossible unless you get a happen to get a job at a AAA company, uh, you know, with with benefits and the whole shebang. Um, if you are a uh, if you're a freelancer, it's just going to take you time to build up that client base and um, to get that rate that you that is going to make it so you can sustain yourself. Keep that in mind. Don't feel like a sellout if you need to have a day job to sustain that. Having a having a stable job um, alongside your freelance career is what's going to allow it to continue going on, and what's going to allow you to keep building those contacts and playing the long game. Uh, I, I talk to a lot of people who say like, "Oh yeah, I you know I started working in this, or I started teaching, or I started doing that, and I feel like a sellout now, or I feel like I, I haven't made it." And um, I, I, I always say like, oh, you know, that's fantastic. Now you can take the jobs that you want to take. Uh, you don't have to feel like your entire livelihood is based on something that's so volatile. 
Um, it's something that's been great for me with, with teaching, right? Uh, not only do I love it, I, I really, really love my teaching job, uh, but it's a part-time job. You know, I, I do that for like 15 hours a week and it really, really allows me to pick projects that I want to work on to not say yes to stuff that's just going to, you know, to, to pay the bills. Um, and it can, it can be fantastic. I, I'm going out to conventions. I'm building my contacts. I'm building my customer base. Um, and, uh, it's just a lot easier to, to do that when you also have something, um, stable. So, uh, that, that's, that's my advice to people, uh, starting out. Don't put, don't put a lot of pressure on yourself to, uh, make all of your income from freelancing. Um, another thing is don't, uh, don't be afraid to get rejected. Uh, it happens to all of us and it does not necessarily have to do with your skills, right? There's, there's so many fabulous composers and sound designers and just all types of audio professionals out there, uh, who get rejected because of things that are completely out of their control, right? Uh, you're never going to get the gig unless you put yourself out there and, and get rejected several times. Just make it a goal for yourself. Like, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to get rejected. Uh, because that's how you eventually end up getting work. Okay, I have to repeat the, the story that I always tell my students, and I also mentioned it in the first episode of this podcast, which is the great Italian composer, uh, one of the greatest composers of all time, Giuseppe Verdi, was not accepted. He was rejected from the Milan Conservatory of Music that is nowadays named after him. So he was actually not accepted to the Verdi Conservatory of Music. <laughs> I think it's a great story to tell your, your students. And I, yeah, I, uh, it, you know, it, it, yeah, I think that that's, that that's a perfect example of uh, why you should go out there and get rejected and not, not take it too personally when it happens. Yeah. So to, to all of you that were rejected, let's say from Berkeley College of Music, maybe Berkeley College of Music will be named after you in a couple of years. Who knows? <laughs> And two last questions, Noah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this very, very interesting and inspiring episode. Thank you for your time and for all the wonderful insights that you've shared. Will AI composing and AI generated music take the jobs of video game composers in the near future or in the far future? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a question that's on on all of our minds, right? Uh, personally, and I, I mean, you know, this is the problem with predictions about the future. It's very possible we'll listen back to this in five years and I'm going to sound like the world's biggest idiot. But, I, but I, I think that the thing that AI is not going to be able to uh, really replace is uh, human ingenuity, right? But I, yeah, I think that the people who are going to really be able to maintain a career and make a career are going to be people who are seen as, as artists who have a unique voice, right? I, I think that um, people with, so to be a little bit more cynical, I think that people with a very strong brand of, of, uh, of you know, a unique artist are, are going to be people that companies gravitate towards. But I think that underneath that is also going to be a lot of uh, ingenuity um, that can't be, can't be replicated. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Also about the connection and the communication, the human communication between, a, let's say, a developer and a composer or a film director and a composer. And I'm an optimistic. I always, I've always been an optimistic. And this podcast is also called an optimistic podcast about music career. So I think exactly like you've said, that at least the part of the communication, I mean, humans are, we always have been towards communication. I mean, that's the most important thing to humans all the time. Even people that are now listening to the podcast are in some way communicating with you, uh, the guest, and with me, the host. I mean, communication will always win. Facebook, social media is all about communication. And also those kind of works, like working with a film director as a composer, and he tells you, could you change something like that? The thing that we've mentioned before, this is something, at least to me, that will not be ever replaced by AI. Yeah, I totally agree. Okay, so one last question is another future prediction because I'm asking it all the guests in the podcast. Where do you see yourself and what is your vision and dream for yourself in five years from now? Sorry that it's another future prediction, but it is always the last question of any episode. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's a great, that's a great question uh, to end on. 
Um, yeah, I, so I'm really, you know, I'm putting my roots down in Boston. Um, I, I really like it here. Um, <clears throat> and I, I love my job at Berkeley. I definitely see myself uh, still teaching there, still developing the program. Um, and that's uh, become a really, really great part of my life that um, I'm, I'm really, really happy about. So uh, I think still teaching in a, in a part-time capacity. Um, I definitely want to make sure that there's still time in my life for um, for my freelance work. Um, I think, uh, like I mentioned before, I had a chance to work on a game, uh, Proto Droid Delta, that was published by Humble Games. Um, they're, uh, they kind of represent this group of publishers, a uh, group of indie publishers like uh, Devolver Digital and Annapurna are also some of the other big ones. Um, that have been uh, investing in really, really cool, uh, polished, uh, uh, just very unique indie games. Uh, I'd really like to work on more games with these types of, of publishers. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd say that that sort of high-end indie area that we've seen uh, develop in the last couple of years, uh, that's, that's where I, I really just kind of want to stay uh, and uh, see my career go towards. Wonderful. And I'm looking forward to having you as a guest again in December 2028 and talk about... <laughs> <laughs> I'll put it on my calendar. <laughs> exactly. And talk about the career and all the developments that occurred uh, since the first episode with you. Composer Noah Beasley, thank you so much for being a guest in this episode. It was really a very interesting and inspiring. And I think we touched upon a lot of interesting topics that will give a lot of insights, both technical and inspirational to all the listeners. Uh, thank you so much for having me. This was, this was really great. Thank you. And to all the listeners, thank you also so much for tuning in and for staying until the very end. Feel free to reach out with any questions. You can look me up on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, or through my email listed on my website where I share more content about music career. You can visit my website at www.amitwiner.com slash rewind and don't forget to rate the podcast and give it a follow it will help it reach more people who might find it interesting and if you like this episode don't forget to rewind it and send it to a friend i will see you in the next episode with another super special guest stay tuned bye bye welcome to rewind an optimistic podcast that'll help you in your successful career in music. Amit Weiner hosts musicians, composers, professors, and sound wizards as they share their life stories and career decisions. Stay tuned, it's gonna be epic.